Hi, I'm Henry English Wong, and I'm part of the QA support team. The QA support team was put together to help out the rest of the development team with extra tasks. And I'm Herschel Bailey. I'm one of the QA testers from Ratchet and Clank Future, specializing in sound. Um, there are a couple of other testers with uh, specializations in their in different fields of the game, like AI, environment, and economy. Uh, since I have an educational background in sound, I was chosen for that specific specialization. Yeah, the QA support team started doing special tasks like that for other departments on resistance, but it got to be so much that we got pulled away from testing the game. So Doug, our QA manager, proposed that we be put into our own department to help out with various tasks. We do stuff like placing paths for the pterodactyls you see flying around Kabalia, editing voiceovers for Jackie, and <laughs> uh, flagging materials for sound responses like footsteps so Herschel here can check them out. Yeah, I check basically everything that goes in sound-wise. Uh, make sure that it's synced, uh, that it's running without any distortion. Basically means I'm never allowed to take my headphones off. Yeah, I got a ton of bugs from Hershaw on Resistance. Yeah, well, you know, I'm just doing my job, man. Yeah, you're just trying to make me look bad. <laughs> I'm kidding, you do a great job. But uh, you're pretty good at just catching all the surfaces that just miss materials. Yeah, being in QA, it's um, really tedious. We just have to wander around doing uh, repetitive tasks over and over again, trying to get into the small spots and the hard to reach places, just to make sure that everything is consistent throughout each level. Yeah, I remember doing a lot of that on uh, Ratchet Deadlocked, and it's pretty cool to see the developmental jump from PS2 to PS3. Yeah, it was really cool working on uh, Resistance for the first time with the actual developers. I was able to actually get in and talk to them and tell them uh, that there were certain issues in different locations, and I wasn't thought of as crazy anymore. What, you mean you weren't crazy? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Lies! <laughs> it's cool because the company's able to do surround sound testing now, which originally was done all at Sony. So we were able to get all this gear in, which was kind of like Christmas for me because I love all that stuff. And I got to uh, plug it in and crawl up into the ceilings and wire everything up. It was pretty cool. Yeah, I'm sorry I missed that. Well, that's all for us. Yep. See you later. Hi, my name is Nathan Fouts, and I programmed most of the large enemies and bosses in Ratchet & Clank Future. The Leviathan is a long, snake-like enemy, which would have taken many hand-animated sequences to create smooth motion through the air. Instead, we used a combination of hand animation and programmatic animation. An animator animated his face and gills, and I programmatically moved his spine, fins, and tail. With this system, the creature can move however we want him to through the air, and he still bends and turns his long body and tail, with the dragging nicely behind him. It gave us a lot more freedom to how he behaves and let him move around the world in a more dynamic manner than we could have done using only traditional animation. The centipede uses a similar system of traditional programmatic animation. When they slink into the scene, they are following a preset path, and the programming lets their spine match the curve of the path. When they rear up to fight, they blend back to traditional animation. Thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Jackie Wyrock, and I'm the Dialogue Specialist at Insomniac Games. While working on Resistance Fall of Man, I discovered one of our actors, Richard Horvitz, was a huge Ratchet & Clank fan. How did I know this? Well, he proceeded to very excitedly tell me about all of the adventures that Ratchet & Clank have gone on for the past five years. He gave incredibly detailed descriptions of boss battles, he quoted lines of dialogue, and he even pointed out where he encountered problems completing challenges in the games. So I just knew that I had to find a place for Richard when it came time to cast Ratchet & Clank Future Tools of Destruction. I was almost finished casting RCF and I still hadn't found the right role for Richard. I was getting a little concerned that there wasn't a place for Richard in the world at this time. But then magic happened. I received Richard's audition for the Zony. It was exactly what I'd envisioned. Perfection, I'd found his role. When we recorded the Zony dialogue, we recorded each line seven times. Well, not because Richard's not a good actor, because he's really, 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 really good. But we needed to try to create this illusion of a group of Zony. So when he recorded each line, he recorded it at the same pace as the previous line so that I could then layer them one on top of the other. To further enhance this illusion, each sound designer came up with different vocal processes to try out on the Zony dialogue. 
We sat down and reviewed everyone's efforts as a group. Well, except for Chris, because I don't think he came up with a process for that one. Anyway, we came to the conclusion that Jamie McMinimi's process was the best choice. Jamie's process involved inserting one second of silence at the start and end of each file, raising the pitch by three semitones while preserving the duration of the file, reversing the dialogue, applying reverb, reversing it again, trimming the silence from the file, and finally normalizing the audio. Here's an example of the final result. This door poses no threat to you, sire. Aim time to your will, and you shall pass. Richard, Morgan, Brian, TJ, Paul, Dwight, Jamie, Mark, Chris, it's been an honor and a pleasure working with you on this game. Hi, I'm Mike Ellis, senior designer here at Insomniac. When designing a ratchet and clank level, the designers use several processes. First, we establish a metrics guide. This enables us to figure out how fast ratchet can move, how far he can jump, and so forth. Using this guide, the designers know how wide to make the gaps, how tall climbable objects should be, and how long it will take ratchet to perform certain moves. Then, we set about creating challenges that fit to the level's theme. For instance, here in the Imperial Fight Festival, the platforming challenges are all based upon rides from theme parks, but with a devious tachyon twist. The trick is to fuse the metrics and the challenges together under a single unified theme. If done right, the experience should be seamless. Hi, my name is Yancey Young and I worked on IFF, particularly the segment you just played through. I work for Insomniac as an environment artist and this level was a great experience and a great challenge for me. When they gave me the opportunity to create the rides for IFF, I had just taken a course in basic animation. This came in handy because this segment required some preliminary animation to test their functionality. The first ride I worked on was the grav tube, as I felt this would be the greatest challenge of the three. Originally, I built the grav tube as one gigantic piece so that I'd have all the necessary segments including the saw blades. I hope those were as fun to dodge as they were to make. Mike Ellis, the designer, wanted to incorporate many obstacles into the grav tube along with the magna boot surface so that it would be an intense experience. The idea behind the grav tube is that it would be disorienting to the player while simultaneously testing their hand-eye coordination and I think we achieved that. The second piece I did was the ferris wheel. This piece was just as much fun as the grav tube because although it had fewer obstacles it was massive and it would be one of the few areas in the game that would become a 2D platforming segment. Again. My basic animation class came in handy to test the speed of the rings and to see what it would look like aesthetically. It was a treat to work on this because it brought back a lot of good memories for me. I hope you enjoyed IFF overall as a level. If you're thinking about going into the industry someday, don't be afraid to learn multiple disciplines if only in rudimentary form. As you can see, just because I'm an environment artist doesn't mean I don't have also have to be an animator, an engineer, and a kid. Hi, I'm Brian Matheson, the test lead on RCF. And I'm Billy Parmenter, senior tester on RCF. And we're going to talk about the Fun Not Fun report. So every week or two, the QA team gets together to talk about what's fun, what's not fun, and any suggestions we have to improve the game. Some examples are the over-the-shoulder cam, the six-axis controlled geolaser, and some of the polished things you'll see throughout the game. So one thing that came up was the arena in this level. We noticed that Tachyon, who was currently destroying multiple worlds to get to Ratchet, was just letting him waltz into the arena win a prize, and head right out the door. It seems obvious now, but at the time, these were individual levels without much of the interconnecting story elements. Dialogue, cutscenes, uh, tachyon monitors, stuff like that. The mustache, glasses, and persona of Mustachio Furioso were already planned by the story department, but it was in danger of not making it into the game. When the team read the Fun Not Fun report, they rallied together the animation, art, dialogue, and programming team to get Mustachio into the game. Most other companies only want bugs from their QA department. And Insomniac, regardless of your position in the company, you're a part of the team and your feedback is welcome. Sometimes we're able to convince the dev team to push a little harder to include something that really shows off our sense of humor and ties the story together. My name is Mike Acton. I am part of the tech team here at Insomniac Games. What the tech team does is it builds the core engine technology for our titles. The core engine technology is the code and functionality that allows our gameplay programmers to speak with the hardware and to really give that 
custom power that makes what makes our games what they are. One of the questions that we often get asked is, is the cell, is the PlayStation 3 hard to program for? I don't think this is a really relevant question. Uh, for, from our perspective, what we have is the PlayStation 3. This is the platform we're dealing with. Our job is to take what's in front of us, the tools, the hardware, whatever it is that we have, the content, and push it as ha far as we can go and to make it as good as we possibly can. Whether or not it's hard is both not relevant and not important. We do whatever we can do. Our job is to put our vision, the vision of our gameplay programs, the vision of our designers, the vision of our creative directors on this console. Part of our basic philosophy for making things on, specifically on the cell, is that we're not porting things to the cell. We make things specific for this processor, for both the cell and the RSX, for the PlayStation 3. The SPUs are the core of the cell. The PPU is really a minor player, so what we need to do is concentrate our effort on how much we can put on the SPUs. From that perspective, the first and most important rule for everything that we do is that the data is everything. The only thing that's important is understanding the data, understanding how the data flows through the system, and making good transformation kernels through the process. That means making code that is small, fast, does nothing more than it needs to do, and adds no extra complexity. We want to focus on what is exactly the thing that we need to do to make the game that we're working on. We love what we're doing. We love this title, and I hope that you guys have as much fun playing it as we had making it. Hi, my name is Edward Kim, and I am an assistant project manager at Insomniac Games. This level holds a special meaning for me and several other Insomniacs because it was one of the first levels to truly come to life in pre-production. We received new tech and tools that allowed the art team to take the environment in Ratchet and Clank Future to the next level, a lot of which came to fruition on this amazing level. This was also the first level to get a little ambient creature leaven from our character guys, which you can see if you look up at that giant flying whale-like creature in the sky. Roughly midway through pre-production, the team was able to establish the style and look of our first Ratchet title on PlayStation 3. This came about from a lot of team brainstorming, casual conversations in the kitchen, and plenty of trial and error. Trust me, a lot of trial and error. It was also during this time we had some ideas that didn't quite fit the final vision of the game, and in all honesty was pretty much for selfish reasons just to get some laughs. For example, we uh, thought about bringing the Lawn Gnome back from Resistance as a special pickup, or putting Ratchet in a clank suit, which would be pretty hilarious. We even thought about having paparazzi video of Courtney Gears malfunctioning in public and using a pocket crotchetizer to remove her hair. Oh well, maybe next time. Hi, I'm Dwight Okahara, audio lead on Ratchet and Clank Future. One of the audio department's main goals is to make each level live and breathe so it feels like a real place. The first step is to create the ambient sounds for that world, which in this case is pirate bass. If you take a moment to listen, you'll hear the jungle creatures that live on this planet. Depending on where you explore, you'll also hear waterfalls, drippy caves, and more. To make sure the audio is appropriate for the area you're in, we go where we need to, capturing just the right sounds. To do this, we use some of the most sophisticated audio equipment you can get. And when it doesn't exist, we invent it. We go straight to Clank Laboratories, where he sets us up with awesome stuff, like the Super Hyper Omni Cardioid Polar Pattern Wireless Condenser Microphone, capable of handling SPLs in excess of over 480 decibels. Combine that with outboard effects like the discombobulating 48 to 1 ratio compressionator with balanced 6 conductor phantom power D to A converting IOs and you have a very sweet location rig to record all the sounds you'll ever need. Team Audio is Jackie, Paul, Dwight, Mark, Jamie, Chris, and David. And sometimes, Sean. Thanks for listening. Hi, this is Crook. And Zephyr. <laughs> Actually, it's a good thing we're not the voice actors. This is Ben. And Corey, and we're the animators on Kronk and Zephyr, so we're here to talk a little bit about what direction we wanted to take these guys with in the game. Uh, we wanted to push the idea that these guys are these old war veterans and longtime buddies. Uh, we tried to keep them young at heart, but now in these rusted, falling apart, 82-year-old bodies. Um, I wanted Kronk to seem like he was more of the knowledgeable one, sort of the, the wise leader of the two. 
or at least he thinks he is. Uh, but in reality, he's, he's missing a few bolts. Yeah, so I definitely wanted to contrast um, Kronk's character with Zephyr being kind of the younger one, more gung-ho. Um, he's a few years younger than Kronk, and he's always kind of making fun of him for being the older, kind of crotchety robot. So I tried to, you know, play up that relationship between those two. Yeah, and I, I think you see a really good example of of this in uh, the beginning of Riken 5 when Kronk just goes, like, running up, charging with the bomb in hand, throws it on the door, goes running back, and uh, completely forgets to detonate the thing. Yeah, so the designers threw in, like, a lot of cool little bits like that where you just kind of get to see the relationship between the two with, uh, you know, these little little plays that go on. So it, yeah. uh, it definitely helped to... Um, bring them to life I think yeah and I think Zephyr was always sort of like compensating for Kronk's shortcomings yeah, as definitely. he goes running up there to detonate the bomb but these guys were actually a lot of fun to, to work on yeah definitely hi I'm Brian Bernal assistant project manager on Ratchet and Clank future tools of destruction the Rhino, which is short for Rip Ya a New One, if you're familiar with the series, has been a staple of uh, the Ratchet universe since the first game back in 2001. Since the Rhino is basically the ultimate tool of destruction, we also thought it would be really cool for players to have a more direct involvement in its construction. Scattered throughout the uh, Polaris galaxy are a bunch of really... Uh, uh, small little bits of this lost hollow plan for the Rhino, and uh, there's actually 13 of them. So if you uh, find those 13 lost hollow plans and return them to an unscrupulous individual named the Smuggler, um, he will actually uh, create this uh, weapon for you. And uh, of course, it, it is for a small price. Now, I'm um, we really like this idea because we thought it would add another level of depth and fiction to one of our favorite weapons in the game. And so we hope the players really feel the same way about it. It utilizes our NPC scenes and it also utilizes the uh, new lip sync system. So we really like the idea of doing this because it adds another level of depth and fiction to one of our favorite weapons in the game. And we hope that, that players feel the same way about it. Hi, I'm Jake Sones. I'm the interface designer. I designed and scripted the HUD, menus, and vendors. I also worked on the decryptor, which went through a bunch of different iterations before we settled on this version. I really liked the decryptor from RC3. It had a good old school feel to it since we took a lot of inspiration from Tempest. This time I wanted to keep a similar vibe, but give it more of a puzzly feel. We started off thinking about wacky hybrids of other old school games and briefly considered something that would have been like a mashup of Puzzle Bobble and Arkanoid but we ran into all kinds of logistical problems when figuring out exactly how that would work. The version we settled on was initially inspired by Pipe Dream. In order to bring the six-axis into the mix, we looked at some of the wooden labyrinth games where you tilt a board to move a marble through a maze. After a bunch of tweaks to get the ball rolling and board tilting to feel right, we took it to playtesting, where we ended up redesigning several puzzles so they'd be more readable. If you're playing in challenge mode, you'll notice that we swapped out the puzzles for harder versions. Some of those are the original puzzles that proved too difficult for the first playthrough, Others I designed specifically to be extra tricky. Hopefully there'll be a couple that you'll need to look at for a bit before you get them. Good luck! Hi, this is Eric Christensen. I'm on the Insomniac Engine team. I designed and programmed Insomniac's physics engine. When we released Resistance Fall of Man, our physics system was not fully taking advantage of the cell processor's awesome power. Most of the system was running on the cell's slowest processor, called the PPU. The calculation-heavy components such as the collision and simulation were running on the faster asynchronous processors, called the SBUs. However, they were merely using the SBUs as coprocessors, meaning the code ran faster but didn't make use of the SBUs as they were intended. Most of the benefit of running an asynchronous process was absorbed by the cost of building data for the SPUs on the PPU. The data was also wildly scattered and had to be extracted and organized on the PPU just so everything could fit in SPU memory. The size of the code was so large that it limited the amount of simultaneous interactions between physics objects. Basically, the simulation was limited by whatever memory was left after the code was uploaded. This required the physics update to be broken up into stages that each had to be synced on the PPU before the next one could be started. For Ratchet & Clank Future Tools of Destruction, we redesigned the physics system to truly take advantage of the SPUs. 
The physics update now requires minimal PPU interaction and all data management is initiated from the SPUs. This means that the physics system can run in parallel with other systems as well as code running on the PPU. In order to facilitate this process, it was necessary to break up the key functions in a collision and simulation code and convert them into dynamically loadable code fragments. This allowed more collision and simulation data to be resident on the SPU since only the code that was required at each stage was in memory. Because of this, the collision simulation systems ran concurrently, DMAing what they need only when they need it. This was a much needed performance boost and allowed us to simulate much more than what was even remotely possible before. We hope you're enjoying our game as much as we've had making it. Hello, my name is Jeff Evans and I'm a senior tools programmer at Insomniac. I'm responsible for leading the development of our level editor named Luna. The level you're seeing right now is the result of a team effort by people in a number of different disciplines here at Insomniac. The environment, design, effects, and sound teams all have a hand in producing the final level. At Insomniac, we use a technology we call Zones to let more than one user access a portion of the level at the same time. The level you see now is divided into multiple zones, and each zone is a unique slice of the complete level. Zones collect objects in the game world that serve a common purpose. For example, this level contains several zones for environment art. One zone may contain the buildings and architecture while others contain the pebbles and rocks on the ground. The visual effects team uses a separate zone to place environmental visual effects, and the sound department has their own zone to place sound environment objects that give different regions of the level ambient sound effects. The designer for this level also has several zones that they use to place enemies, grind rails, elevators, crates, or other interactive gameplay objects. Since each zone is stored in a separate file, different users can modify the same level at the same time by only working in the zones they need access to. Because of this, zones are a huge benefit for our production schedule and bug fixing. The main concept zones provide is known as parallelism, and is a big part of successfully making games for the most recent generation of game consoles. My name is Andrew Yant, and I'm a senior gameplay programmer for Insomniac Games. This is my third Ratchet project. I started with Up Your Arsenal, and among other things, I created all the weapons for Tools of Destruction. The weapons have always been one of the key features of Ratchet & Clank series, and in fact, most of the weapons have been in development for over two years. We started the project uh, by prototyping dozens of weapon ideas and uh, deciding which we wanted to keep and which we wanted to uh, throw away which ones were fun and which ones uh, were not. The weapon that received the most attention from our fans and the media has been the Groovatron. We all love this weapon here, but in terms of programming, it has been one of the simplest weapons to implement. In fact, it was in nearly this exact state two years ago when we started this project. It was fully functional from nearly day one. However, the simple programming uh, has been balanced by the enormous amount of work our animators have had to do to provide unique dancing animations for every character in the game. We've been adding dancing animations to the game up until, well, now. If only all of our weapons could have been so easy to implement. Hi, I'm Matt Hassenplug, a visual effects artist at Insomniac Games. One of the challenges we had to overcome with RCF was taking an effects system designed for realistic looking effects and creating a believable, cartoony style that fit in the Ratchet universe. But by using ordinary things in extraordinary ways, we were able to create a visual style to the effects that achieved the look and feel we were looking for. Some of the first effects created were the fusion grenades explosion, the mortars that fall from the sky, and the pirate's death explosions. The elements in those helped to define the look for the rest of the effects in the game. Our work can be seen everywhere, from everything that gets destroyed in Metropolis to the battle with Tachyon. A common effect in Ratchet is the explosion. We use a particle system to add smoke, fire, flashes, distortion, sparks, and streaks. When we are happy with the effects, we give them to the gameplay team and they put them in the game. In fact, about 1,200 of them went into RCF.
Welcome to Zordum Prison. You're here with Dave Gurton and Greg Baldwin. We're part of the character team at Insomniac Games, and what we do is really try to bring these enemies that you love to shoot to life. Now, one of the biggest challenges we face when doing this is making sure that these characters stay clear on screen. Now, the only way we can do that is to make sure that the silhouettes of these crazy, crazy creatures are as clean and as clear as possible so you know where to aim. So, as you look around this level, you're probably going to notice that there's nice broad arcs, there's very clean shapes with each one of these enemies that you're in the process of attacking right now. Now, you'll also notice that within the center of these characters is plenty of detail. So what we do is we tend to internalize a lot of that detail so that their broad shapes stay clean while you still get all the beautiful detail of the PS3. But the shapes are just one part of the equation. Personality also goes a long way. Yeah, I mean, we've designed a lot of these characters before. There's always going to be hundreds of enemies when, within a franchise. And this time we thought we'd go crazy, like Dave said. And this time we took fish heads and we stuck them in robot bodies. I mean, that's just funny to us. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, I mean, giving giving a ferocious little fish the ability to, you know, blast your hero character right off the screen, that's going to be hilarious every single time. And when you see a character over and over, that's what we want to give you as an experience. Sounds good to me. <laughs> good job, Greg. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. And we're Greg and Dave from Insomnia Games. Peace. Hey kids, my name is Paul Hale, or some of you know me from the forums, Pac-Man. I'm the release engineer for the tools department here at Insomniac Games. I'm here to talk to you today about the dreaded Entity Refactor, or what those of us in the tools department like to call the real tools of destruction. Back when this project first started, we were using a very different set of tools. In fact, we were using almost the exact same set of tools we used to make resistance. What's wrong with that, you ask? Well, plenty of things, to be honest. The tools we used to develop Resistance were actually based on the same tools we used to make PlayStation 2 titles. The technology was just old, very disorganized, and getting stale. It was time for a change, or a clean slate if you will, and that's what we call the Entity Refactor. From the day Resistance went gold until about three months into the Tools of Destruction production cycle, the tools department was hard at work, banging out a brand new set of tools. Almost everything down to the very core was stripped away and rewritten in a more unified, organized, PlayStation 3-centric manner. The reason why it was called the Entity Refactor is we actually changed the way the game objects exist and are built into the game. Instead of having several different types of object, we unified them all under the term Entity to take the burden of creating specific object types off the developers. Once we were somewhat confident with the new tool set, the transition began, releasing these tools to the rest of the company and somehow getting all the work that they had already put into Tools of Destruction converted over to the new formats that the new tools would expect. It wasn't easy. For a good two weeks we basically wrecked any sort of production that people were trying to do. Getting everything back up and running again was tough, but we got it done. The following four to six weeks were packed with late nights and a flurry of patches and adjustments, and in some cases even reconversions from the old assets to make sure that no work was lost in the massive switch. Today we have a much more stable, unified set of tools, with a single game world editor that was used to create nearly every aspect of the game you're playing right now. And that is the Entity Refactor, or what I like to call the real tools of destruction. Some quick shouts to Pyro, Lyris, Final Dragon, Mr. Clam, Detroit, Vin, Yashmath, Hobo, Timmy, Duke, and all the awesome kids on the Insomniac Games forums, and of course, all the agents of Doom. Thanks, and enjoy the game. Hi there. My name is Ryan Schneider. I'm Insomniac Games' marketing director. Captain James is a character we created in honor of James Westbrook, a boy in Oklahoma who was paralyzed in a car accident. In early 2007, his family was featured on a popular U.S. TV show called Extreme Makeover Home Edition, where the Westbrook's home was completely rebuilt and each family member received a special room to commemorate their hobbies or lifestyle. James loves video games and wants to design them when he grows up. So we wanted to help James get started on his dream. Because of the show's format, we had to concept, model, rig, animate, and program Captain James within one week. It was well worth the effort, and we hope you enjoy blasting away with him. Hi, my name's Moo, like the sound a cow makes. I'm the lead gameplay programmer on Ratchet & Clank Future Tools of Destruction. I was one of the few people lucky enough to work on the project from the very beginning. With so little experience, though, uh, leading the gameplay team in the process of bringing Ratchet & Clank Future to the PS3 was pretty intimidating, but it turned out to be an absolutely amazing experience. The best thing about pre-production is that the sky's the limit. Nothing is out of bounds, anything is possible. The worst thing about pre-production is that the sky's the limit, 
nothing is out of bounds, anything is possible. We had just tons and tons of ideas floating around for all sorts of different insane things. Whittling it down seemed like an absolute impossibility. It all started coming together though, when we picked Kirchu City for our pre-production goal. It was just such a cool level with so much different stuff for everyone that, you know, everyone had something to sink their teeth into. It finally gave us the focus that we'd been looking for the whole time. My favorite part of the level is the boss fight. I love boss fights, and because we had time to, in pre-production, we did what we could to make the boss fight as over the top as possible. With a chase sequence build up, gravity changing grind rail, final, final upside down arena battle against a 20 meter tractor beast, this definitely turned out to be a fight that, that was worth the effort. And the boss fight is only one segment of the level. We also threw in Kirchu, pirates, barge rides, exploding mortars, and all sorts of other stuff. I guess that's probably why Kirchu City is the last level that's out of memory right now. Hopefully we'll be getting that in shape in the next couple of days, and I hope you enjoy it. My name is Zach Adams, and I'm a senior environment artist at Insomniac Games. The Kirchu boss segment was the first level that fellow artist Chris Capilli and I worked on after finishing Resistance, and it immediately presented some interesting challenges. The first challenge was not only getting back into the look and feel of the Ratchet and Clank universe, coming from the hyper-realistic Earth environment of Resistance, but also coming to grips with what a Ratchet game on the PS3 should even look like. Jacinda Chu, Tom Barlow, and Nathaniel Bell were the artists on the pre-production team, and they created the bulk of Kirchu City, so we had a lot of great textures and geometry to start with and to use as reference. The second challenge was actually a pretty common one here at Insomniac, and that was matching the art in the level to some pretty unusual gameplay. In this case, it was making the level look as good upside down as it does right side up. During the grind rail portion, Ratchet rotates around 180 degrees and ends up fighting the boss upside down on a series of magnetic catwalks and platforms as they're being destroyed out from under him. It took a fair amount of trial and error and fine tuning with the designers and programmers, but I think the end result is a great example of the unusual gameplay that really defines a Ratchet and Clank game. Hi, I'm Darren, and I'm the lead environment concept artist on Ratchet & Clank Future. In this section, I'm going to talk a little bit about how concept art ties in with the construction logic of the game environment. Um, and here, we'll be looking at some of the uh, ideas and processes that went into Slag's base. Uh, we found out that this level would be a pirate base set in space. So when we started out concepting the level, we used things like nautical themes to help influence how some of the architecture would look like. In this example, we wanted buildings to take on the form of sea animals, say like the octopus or squids. When I drew up the images for this level, I laid out a lot of visual reference that would influence the designs so that they would fit within the larger theme of the level. So when you run through the environment, you'll see buildings with bulbous forms that are supported by large tendril-like cabling that extend from their bases and into the surrounding asteroids. And to bring it all back down to Earth a bit, it was also important to put in believable uh, details to complement some of the crazier elements of this level. So you'll see things like masts and cranes incorporated into the buildings, um, and smaller details like netting or lamps reinforced with wrought iron. Having objects like that we can all relate to helps make the space feel a little bit more believable. So there you have it. It's just one of the many examples of the types of thinking that starts from ideas and images and ends up as a final game level. Hi, this is Drew Murray. I'm one of the designers on Ratchet and Clank Future Tools of Destruction, and I'm going to talk about pirates. Arr! One of the things the designers wanted to do for this debut of Ratchet and Clank on the PlayStation 3 was to really focus on making our world seem more real and immersive by creating certain characters and themes and building on them throughout the game. One of those themes was the robot Space Pirates. The Space Pirates aren't the main villains of the game, and while they're involved in the story, they aren't the central focus. But for Ratchet and Clank Future, we wanted to take what could have just been a one-planet theme and make it into a memorable and lasting part of the game. We started by creating a diverse collection of pirate enemies who in different combinations could provide an interesting challenge over a number of levels. Then came up with our special characters, Captain Slag and his sidekick, Rusty Pete. These guys are big players in our cinematics and Slag provides a great boss battle at the end of the level that you're playing. Lastly, we developed some special gameplay elements that were built around the pirate theme to really immerse the player in the world of robot space pirates. The pirate disguised dancing minigame is the most obvious gameplay element. 
but we also tried to give the ratchet spin to pirate themes like broadside ship battles reimagined with spaceships, fireside pirate conversations that Ratchet can eavesdrop on, the insomniac version of Skull Rock, and body pirate space chanties. With all of these elements, we hope that the players really get to know the pirates as characters and as part of the Ratchet and Clank universe. I hope you enjoy the game, and remember, if on your hand there's a pirate hook, and on your back a robot clank, dance a jig with pirate spirit, and Ratchet won't have to walk the plank. Hello, my name is Bill Powers, the QA support lead. QA support, as you probably heard Henry in an Infobot explain earlier, is a special division of QA that helps out various other departments with miscellaneous tasks. We mainly help out art, animation, design, and sound. Being the lead, I get to schedule out our tasks and boss Henry around. This can be very difficult because Henry doesn't listen to me and I don't speak English. <laughs> Scheduling is actually tough because many of our tasks are plan aren't planned in pre-production. They tend to only come up when necessary at various times during production. The level you are currently in is Cragmite Ruins, where I set up many chunk bangles on the enemies that you'll fight. The Tachyon Walker, the Cyclocannon, the Tachyon Gunships are examples of enemies that explode with chunks. Chunks are pieces of art I set aside in the master file and set up as bangles. The programmers then spawn those bangles as the enemies are destroyed. The walker was especially interesting to me because I had to set it up several times during production. The first time I set it up with about five or six bangles, which was what we were doing for the enemies at the time. As production got further and further along, we decided that we wanted the enemies to explode with more pizzazz. So we set it up the second time with about 18 bangles. The third time I had to go back because we made another copy of the walker, and the fourth time I had to reskin the bangles that I did. This is actually a, a big part of the process during production, is I have to go back and redo a lot of the work. I know it might sound monotonous and boring, but it actually is a lot of fun. The capital ransom using a neothermic death beam capable of laying waste to any planet in its path. Hi everyone, this is Phil Alora, And this is Peter Cornforth from Insomniac's Cinematic Team. We're here to tell you about the process of creating the exciting Ratchet & Clank Tools of Destruction in-game movies. After the script's worked out for the game's story, we take each scene from the script and its accompanying audio track and we start putting it all together. I'll start by reading through the script and drawing 2D storyboard panels that will become the visual structure of each scene. Storyboards are like a comic strip which shows the characters acting and performing a scene's business. While Phil's working on the storyboards, I gather all together the individual assets that will be used like 3D characters, sets, props, vehicles, etc. Once I've pulled them all together, I place them in a 3D art file. After Pete has prepared the scene file, I'll use my storyboards as a guide to construct the scene in 3D. I'll block out the timing of the camera cuts, shot compositions, continuity of the sequence, pose the characters, and add the audio track. Now the scene is ready for the animators to bring the characters to life. Once the animation is complete, each scene gets a unique lighting setup and placed visual effects such as explosions, laser blasts, and sparks. Then we get the scene built so that it plays back in the game code. We make sure there's no bugs and glitches and it's ready for the game. Thanks for listening. Donde esta la biblioteca? La plume de matan es sur la table. Sore wine pizu des. Oh hi, I'm Giacomino Veltri. You may remember me from other Ratchet titles such as Ratchet and Clank, Up Your Arsenal, and Ratchet, Deadlocked. I was just translating some critical lines of dialogue, but let me take a minute to tell you about one of the many tasks I work on for Ratchet & Clank Future, Tools of Destruction. The wonderful world of localization. Localization is the process by which game assets are converted to a form more suitable for other cultures. Although I was translating lines of dialogue, the localization process can be applied to just about anything. In fact, even Ratchet himself varies across cultures. Ratchet & Clank Future Tools of Destruction is localized in 15 languages, including French, Italian, German, Spanish, Portuguese, Danish, Finnish, Swedish, Norwegian, Dutch, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, English, and UK English. So go ahead, enjoy Ratchet & Clank Future Tools of Destruction for the first time all over again, in Norwegian! Welcome the 
Hi, I'm TJ Fixman, and I'm the writer for Ratchet & Clank Future Tools of Destruction. I'm here to talk about the final showdown between Ratchet and Emperor Tachyon inside the Court of Azimuth. Brian Hastings, Brian Algar, and I had several meetings over the course of production, trying to figure out just how to end the story. The original idea was to have Tal betray Ratchet by stealing the Dimensionator and giving it to Tachyon at the end of Act 3, in the hopes of saving her father. I rewrote the script so Tachyon released the Kragmites at the end of Act 2, and wrote the final showdown to be more about stopping him from using the Dimensionator to bring back the rest of his race. The idea of opening a portal to the Lombaxes came about in the second or third draft. We wanted to show the sacrifice Ratchet was making by destroying the Dimensionator, and there was really no better way of doing that than actually showing what the Dimensionator could do. It's a huge moment in Ratchet's life. He now knows that he's not the only Lombax left in existence, and that he does have a home, whether it's with Clank or on the other side of the portal. I'm especially proud of this scene because we've never done anything like it in previous games. In the past, we've just had the villain show up, monologue a bit, and begin the fight. But in this scene, Tachyon actually taunts Ratchet on an emotional level. I remember James, our voice actor, while recording the scene, looked up and said, Wow, you've got Ratchet getting into some heavy material this time. Well, we hope you enjoyed the story as much as we enjoyed putting it together.